You're listening to the National Oceanography Center's Into the Blue podcast, where we tackle some of the biggest questions facing our ocean today by speaking to experts and voices from the world of oceanography. Hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello, I'm Dr. Zoe Jacobs, and today I'm joined by Alan Evans to talk about marine policy, which helps us monitor and protect the ocean. So welcome, Alan. I'm really looking forward to getting stuck into this topic. Hi, Zoe. Thank you. So can you start by giving us um, a bit of a background about your career so far? I can. Um, well, I've been here at the NOC now since 1997, mm. uh, barring one year. And pretty much for all of that time, I've worked on either implementing policy or somehow influencing its drafting through various forum. And I guess my first foray into you know implementing policy or, or a framework um, would be implementing or applying Article 76 of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which was to define areas of continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles. So that involved colleagues at the NOC, working with colleagues at the United Kingdom Hydrographic Office and the then Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Cool. So that was my first foray into applying policy. Um, and what that highlighted to me was almost the symbiotic relationship between the technical requirements of implementing policy and the need for that uh, legal mm. uh, input as well. Mm. That sounds really important. <laughs> so what's your, what is your actual role at NOC kind of day to day? Well, I, I guess what that first mm. foray highlighted to me was A, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and CLOS mm. has a lot in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, Article 76 is one of 320. And then the second recognition was how much marine science can actually be used to implement so many parts of mm. the convention. So that opened my eyes to a possibility for the use of marine science and opened my eyes also having worked with the UK government in how we could have that relationship with governments to make sure mm. that the decisions and the, the, the ideas that they were framing were informed by the best science that we as an organization could provide. Yeah, no, that sounds great. So obviously it's really important to have policies in place to keep our oceans protected. Um, how do we actually go about creating these policies? Can you tell us a bit about that process? I, I can try. I mean, <laughs> it, it's almost a, a, a nested approach. So mm -hmm. if we start with the, the UNCLOS, uh, the UN uh, Convention on Law, or Law of the Sea, that sits almost on top of the tree. And the beauty of the UNCLOS is it's formulated through the UN as okay. a forum. And the UN as a forum has the convening power to bring a global community together mm -hmm. to deliver a global um, framework. So that almost sets the, the bar for countries to look at. So the, 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 the UNCLOS is effectively the Bible for the ocean. It okay. provides that legal order yeah. for what we do in the ocean. And we use the terms legal order, but that implies everything that we do in the ocean from, you know, exploiting its resources to actually undertaking the marine scientific research. It's all covered by the UNCLOS. Mm. So if we start at that high level framework, the UNCLOS itself has implementing agreements. So one of which is on part 11 of the UNCLOS that's relating to deep sea mining, where in 1994, there's a implementing agreement for how that part of the convention would get um, delivered. We also have the 1995 fisheries stock mm -hmm. agreement uh, that manages fisheries of the ocean. And now we have the new treaty for the high seas. So you can see how the underneath the UNCLOS you have this lower level of implementing agreements and they themselves start to establish that global framework for marine governance. Mm -hmm. Now in order to deliver on those national or national policies or, or countries look at what the obligations that they've agreed to through these global governance frameworks. And they then tend to inform the governments what it is that they need to do in order to deliver their obligations that they've agreed okay. to in those treaties. And in that example, you can take one state, it may have no reliance on the marine environment for supporting its peoples, and ultimately that's what governments are for. Um, in which case it can develop marine policies which may focus purely on the protection and preservation mm -hmm. of the marine environment. You might have another state which is wholly reliant on the marine environment, whether it's fisheries or whether it's through tourism, 
Now, the way it develops policies to manage the marine state will, of course, be very different to how the other states would do that. So looking from the very high level of UNCLOS down to the national and even regional level, um, the development of the policies, whilst looking up, is also you know very localised in that sense. Mm. Sorry, that was kind of like a lot of information, yeah. but it's really cool. It's um, something I've not really thought about, the kind of over, the overarching kind of framework and how this kind of staggers down from yeah. like a global, national, regional. Cool. Yeah. Um, so it's obviously really important that we have these policies in place to protect the ocean, mm -hmm. but it's also important um, for scientists, would yeah. you say? I, I would, because... <clears throat> the, 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 the nature of science has changed recently and, and that's partly driven by the funding mm. and funders more so these days they want some impact out of their funding. Now that's not to say there's not blue skies funding available to do research but more and more so there is a need for science to inform decision makers yeah. and by having these policies and these regional and global frameworks enables the scientists to understand what is it what, ev what evidence, what information is required mm. so that that can be used by the decision makers. So they are very important in, in, in setting the agenda for what kind of research mm. may, need, may be required. Yeah, big for kind of research impact. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so, slight change of direction. So it's great to have you on actually because I've been dying to talk to you about the uh, High Seas Treaty mm -hmm. that was signed last year. Quick round of applause for me. So, <laughs> Thank you. First of all, what do we actually mean when we talk about the high seas? So the high seas, well, the UNCLOS, the UNCLOS defines what marine estate a country has the rights and responsibilities to manage. Okay. Uh, within the convention, every country has a right out to 200 nautical miles. Mm -hmm. And for some countries where they can demonstrate a continental shelf beyond that, they have the rights to exploit the resources in that area. Okay. However, the high seas is effectively well, it is the area beyond the 200 nautical mile limit. Okay. For which the UNCLOS provides some general obligations to preserve and protect, but it doesn't actually have specific mandates that states can point at and say, this is what we can do in those areas, which are termed as beyond national jurisdiction. Okay, so for each country, um, they kind of have rights over their region. Correct. Um, but beyond that, it's kind of fair game. Uh, you, <laughs> you, could, you could say, yeah. I mean, like I say, there are general obligations within the convention. Yeah. So collectively, you know, states could come together through forum like the UN. And if there was some something happening in areas where they nationally, you don't have a right to challenge or to do anything. Yeah. They could come together through, you know, international forum, multilateral forum like mm. that. But that's right. Beyond 200 nautical miles, there was very little oversight right. of what could take place. Yeah. And why is it so important to regulate that region? Uh, this almost this vacuum of, of oversight. So what the High Seas Treaties actually has now enabled is, should there be exploitation of marine genetic resources from right. areas beyond national jurisdiction, there is now a framework to share the benefits of that exploitation with everybody, mm -hmm. with humankind as a whole. The High Seas Treaty also enables the undertaking of environmental impact assessments. So should an industry move further offshore and want to establish, let's say, for an example, a wind farm beyond mm. 200 nautical miles, there was no framework that would that a country or collection of countries could point at and say, well, you know, what, what harm could this potentially do? Now the, mm. now, the High Seas Treaty now has that environmental impact assessment component in it. It also has the ability to establish area-based management tools, which includes marine protected areas. So previously, uh, it wasn't possible to have a, well, there was no global framework to have a global acceptance of areas which could be protected beyond national jurisdiction. Okay. Now, there are regional organizations such as OSPA, which is the OS uh, Oslo Paris Agreement, and they have established MPAs in areas beyond national jurisdiction, but those MPAs are only uh, they only apply to the membership of OSPA, right. which are predominantly countries bordering North East Atlantic. They don't apply to any other country. Mm. And what the High Seas Treaty will enable is that when there are 
MPAs established through the treaty mechanism that's binding on all countries that are members of the treaty. Mm. And the fourth kind of pillar of the treaty was to enable everybody to contribute to the obligations of the treaty. So the fourth substantive part of the treaty was to deliver capacity development for everybody so that, you know, so it, it's a global community that can come together to deliver the obligations. Yeah. Um, so it was a pretty landmark event when it was signed. It was, it was, yeah, certainly, <laughs> yeah. Um, why was it so significant? I, I think there had been there had been a few years of lead up into into understanding why we needed uh, a, a new agreement for mm. areas beyond national jurisdiction. It wasn't always accepted that this was a requirement. However, there was a preparatory committee who looked at the Young Clause and other international frameworks, such as what the ISA can deliver, mm -hmm. such as what the IMO can deliver, such as what regional fisheries management organizations can deliver. Those three alone, they have a global reach. So they are already delivering things like marine protection, or they have the mandate to deliver protection of the marine mm -hmm. environment. However, there are a few gaps, such as the EIA requirements, such as being able to establish MPAs that just couldn't be enabled in absence of a new framework. Mm. So it's through this new initiative or new agreements that such things can now take place. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So, and you were actually a member of the UK delegation uh, during the negotiations, weren't you? Um, what was actually involved in that process? It was, well, my role uh, in particular was <coughs> I was working with the UK government predominantly mm -hmm. the FCDO, DEFRA and BASE at the time. And I was acting almost as a uh, science technical advisor, almost doing a sense check on UK positions as mm. the UK governments were considering what positions to take into the negotiations. My involvement was to just make sure that that wouldn't hinder the undertaking of marine scientific research under a new right. agreement. And as NOC is one of the the largest UK organisation undertaking research in areas on the high seas. Um, you know, it was very important to us as an organisation that this new agreement wouldn't hamper what we are trying to achieve in undertaking marine scientific research mm. um, out there. So that was my role working, you know, when we were UK based. Uh, and at the negotiations in New York, I was part of the support group of the UK delegation, providing some um, feedback to the negotiators when we were there. And as the negotiations developed, I also became more involved in the capacity development component, mm -hmm. where actually I sat at the last intergovernmental conference as the UK negotiator uh, for that particular part. Cool. Yeah. How many people were actually involved in the negotiations? Are we talking like hundreds, thousands? In total? Yeah. Um, well, you, you're talking about, you know, over 170 UN member states mm. with varying delegation mm. sizes. So it gives you a sense of the scale. In that a, sense. Lot. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. A lot. A yeah. lot. And how long did the, did the negotiations last? Well, the, the original negotiations, so the first IGC started in, good question, 20, <laughs> where are we now, 2024, 2023, 2019, I think. Oh, yeah. oh, actually, can we, can we check that one? Yeah. <laughs> um, and they finished in 2023. However, okay. there were a, a, there was a precursor preparatory committee before mm. that that lasted a couple of years. Yeah. as well so the actual official um length of from starting the preparatory committee to actually getting the negotiation done was was about five six years mm. wow so, but of course prior to the prepcom there had been some mm. work going on in the background to to try to get it up and running and what about i'm just thinking of the kind of practicality of this because that's a long time kind of towards towards the end of when it was signed was that the kind of event where there were hundreds of people in the same place at the same time, just really trying to get down to the final kind of nitty gritty? Yeah, I mean, the the, the final hours, so to speak, yeah. of the <laughs> negotiations. I mean, the, the there was originally meant to be five intergovernmental conferences. Mm -hmm. the, the fifth one was extended because mm. they failed to find agreement on the text. Mm. And in the final hours of the, the 5.2 IGC, um, the... You know, there was 36 hour negotiations, and, you know, wow. without break. So Ugh. it was tough towards the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Wow. Cool. Sounds like a really um, 
amazing thing to be a part of. Mm -hmm. So that's awesome. So you're also involved with the European Marine Board, aren't you? So that's another forum that influences ocean policy. Is that right? Correct. Yes. So yeah. what exactly do they do? So the European Marine Board, um, it's a European Science Interpolicy Forum. Yeah. Uh, it's an in independent organization uh, made up of its paying members mm -hmm. and they come from research organizations, mm -hmm. research funders and university consortium. Um, the primary purpose of the European Marine Board is to produce influential position papers uh, and policy briefs okay. on topical marine yeah. issues. Um, and it's a superb ne network of mm. European researchers, funders and academic uh, organizations. So. And it is a fairly unique um, institute, for a better word, uh, within the European landscape um, in in delivering these influential publications, which do have lots of um, um, recognition by the policymakers, in particular in the EU, but also nationally as well. Mm. And what's your what's your role? Uh, I'm actually the um, NERC UKRI uh, European Mean Board mm -hmm. member, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm also a vice chair of okay. the board as well. And what does that involve? Uh, well, as a vice chair, you're there almost as a, a member of the kind of guiding committee. We've set the agenda okay. for the board. Um, so that's almost an administrative uh, process. And the board itself, uh, it's when all the members come together. Uh, that's where we discuss topical issues. Mm -hmm. And those topical issues get decided upon and then they uh, become publications, whether they're policy briefs mm. or uh, any other type of publications. Uh, we also hold science symposiums and the, the board itself, the secretariat itself, and it takes a lot of these engagement activities mm. as well to promote the value of marine science, um, but to also to try to influence, you know, the policy direction of, of certain actors. Mm. Yeah. Can you give me a couple of examples of those kind of topics that they're covering at the moment? Yeah, I mean, the, we, we, we led actually, I mean, so we, we proposed prior to COP 27, mm. which, uh, which was 26, actually, which was held in Glasgow, uh, we proposed a topic on ocean observations. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 there are issues at the minute with how ocean observations are, are funded, mm -hmm. not only in the UK, but, but more broadly as well. And the paper was trying to highlight the value of ocean observations mm. in, in providing the kind of foundational information and data that researchers re uh, require to, to do all kinds of research, you know, including for climate change issues. Uh, so we, we led on that publication and it gained quite a lot of traction, mm. actually. So that's one example of where a topical issue yeah. was developed into a policy paper mm. and that's been you know picked up by the EU Commission mm. uh, Great. Uh, for one uh, and, and there are many other policy briefs so uh, we've done some work on habitat mapping recently yeah. where colleagues from NOC have been involved mm -hmm. in that we've done some work on geology and uh, deep sea environment so mm -hmm. there, there's a whole range of topical issues that are discussed as I said between the board members they get voted on to see you know which one is the the, the most popular at the time yeah. and then that's one that gets taken forward yeah and then each of the members then has an opportunity to submit you know names of experts to 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 contribute to those publications and then it's that you it's that european voice that comes together mm. so you have quite a blend of you know positions and ideas and 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 cultures that come in, in into that so it's just fairly unique in that sense yeah yeah, yeah i bet it sounds really interesting um so to finish off what are you working on now is there anything you can tell us about is it all top secret uh, well <laughs> no no no, no <laughs> secrets uh there's actually a lot going on at the minute uh yeah. not unsurprisingly um <laughs> but to highlight a few we alluded to the houses treaty um and that is a new framework that isn't yet in force and in order to ratify that treaty, and it will require 60 states to ratify the treaty right. for it to come into force, there's a lot of work going on in the background. So in the UK at the minute, it's been recognised that we need some domestic legislation for certain components mm -hmm. of the treaty. So we are working with the FCDO to help guide them as to what new legislation should look like. Again, so it doesn't hamper the undertaking of marine scientific research mm -hmm. primarily. So that's one example of you know the continuation of the high seas treaties work 
there's a lot of work going on at the International Seabed Authority at the minute where they're developing regulations for the exploitation of deep sea minerals. Okay. There are regulations in place for the exploration of them, mm-hmm. um, but there's nothing in place for their exploitation. Right. So they're being developed at the minute. Now, some countries are asking for a, a moratorium, as they call it, on on providing licenses for exploitation. Now, mm. the, the regulations aren't in place yet. However, that moratorium is asking for more scientific research to be done so that we can gain better knowledge and better understanding of those deep sea environments and the potential impact mm. of those. Um, so that's going on. But also, when, when that gets done, it, you know, it's important to remind ourselves that under the UNCLOS, you know, the ISA has a, a mandate to fulfill its obligation to to deliver equitable utilization of its resources. So we can't ignore the fact that that's in the convention. Mm. But the value of the work that's going on doing that marine scientific research, gaining that understanding is actually allowing us to fulfill another mandate of the International Seabed Authority to protect the marine environment. Um, so, you know, the, the value that data has been doubled up big time. And we're also doing a piece of work with the ISA at the minute, looking at what marine scientific research has been enabled by the ISA, okay. um, which is a lot, I'll add, uh, and how that actually contributes to the UN Ocean Decade as mm-hmm. well. So again, you know, there is value added from the work that's being enabled through the ISA. Uh, and I guess finally, um, We're doing a lot of work at the um, IOC, which is the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, which is in Paris. And in that forum where the UK provide the UK delegation to the IOC, Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at how the IOC can help its member states develop its national ocean policies Mm -hmm. uh, and strategies. Um, And we're also looking at another piece of work, looking at how we can enable the undertaking of uh, ocean observations within national uh, jurisdiction okay. uh, to make that a bit more of a, a, a smooth, slim, a slim wind, smooth process. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Well, that all sounds incredibly interesting um, and exciting. So good luck with that. Thank you very um, much. Thanks very much for being with us today. Okay, okay. Thank you. Bye. If you're enjoying Into the Blue, please make sure you follow us on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes. New episodes are released every other Wednesday on all major platforms and are also available to watch on the NOC's YouTube. See you next time.